Good morning. My name is Isaac. I think I've got Sarah beat by maybe almost a year, so I'm coming on on eight years now. Not that it's a competition, but so grateful to be part of this church family. Um, before we get started today, I want us to do one short activity. I want you to think of uh, an answer to this. Well, first, I want you to look around, and I want you to find someone that you know a little bit more than their name. So you're kind of sitting beside somebody you might know a little bit, something you could guess something about their about them. And then I want you to think of this question, and you have two answers. Are they more smart or are they more funny? Okay? And you may or may not like the answer, but you get to pick one. <laughs> you get to pick one. Um, and this is an encouraging thing, okay? So don't pick, don't say both, because that's cheating. Um, but uh, also, don't say any other words either. Either smart or funny. Those are the two words you can say. So literally as simple as that, Right now, find that person you were thinking about, that answer that you were going to give them, and say either smart or funny. <clears throat> Don't read between the lines. Okay. So why do we do that? Well, because we're talking about, and we talk about this a lot at Two Rivers, that we're this church family and we know each other. Um, and the people around us, they can see things about us. They know us. They know things about us. And they can speak to us and speak about us. And so the passage we just read or Sarah just read for us is from someone who knew Jesus. This was... His disciple John, also known as the disciple whom Jesus loved, he spent almost every day with Jesus for about three years. And this disciple was a very, very close disciple with Jesus. And in fact, that as Christ was on the cross, he looked down and saw John with his mother Mary and said, basically entrusted the care of his mother to John. You can see John 19 for that at another time, but what John has to say to us matters because John knew Jesus. And he has the authority to speak to our hearts today about who he is. So let's pull that text back up. You see the, the very active um, knowing of Jesus we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we've touched with our hands concerning this word of life. And now he's testifying and proclaiming to us about this eternal life. And this is his message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. You see, this is someone who heard Jesus' voice. He saw him with his own eyes and touched him with his own hands. And this beloved eyewitness testimony is a proclamation that God is not just smart or funny. He is light. And there's no darkness in him at all. And we're going to talk about this word darkness and light today a lot. And when we hear that, we can think physically. Like there are things in the back of the room I can't see right now because they're in the dark. There's a dimness there. Something is obscured in my view. Or it could be there's a depravity or there's something that's broken and there's something incomplete. And what John is saying, definitively, I've been with him, I know him, there's none of that in God. There's nothing hidden that might harm us or betray us. God is someone we can trust completely. And he's light. And when light comes into darkness, darkness is expelled. It runs that's who he is. We can see this all the way in, in the beginning of this text. And, and I'll kind of pause here and say, <clears throat> if you're wondering how to take notes today, I'll tell you. We're going to go through a lot of different scriptures. And you've got a blank page in front of you on your bulletin or in your journal. I want you to just write down some of these references or some verses that come to your mind. Because <clears throat> at the end, we're going to kind of send this home and say, Let's, let's take God's word and let's take this journal that John was talking about. And, and, and maybe you're not an experienced journaler and that's okay. 
I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't consider myself a great journaler either, but we can always write God's word. And that's, and that's what we're going to go home with today, is we're going to go home with God's truth, and we're going to put pen to paper and write it down until it becomes true in our hearts. But we see, starting in verse, the very first words recorded in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth at this time was without form, and it was void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from darkness. And he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. <clears throat> you see, what God's doing here, this particular initiation of light, is God himself shining into these first moments of the dark and formless world. And it, and it paints a picture for us of a stark picture of life without God. You see, it's sheer obscurity and darkness. In fact, God is so different than the darkness, it's actually where he creates this first boundary in his creation. He separates the light from the dark. And just a small note here, this is not the creation of the sun that comes in day four. God is not just metaphorically light. He is the source of all light. And we'll see that and rejoice in that later in Revelation this morning. So then why did God separate light and dark? Well, I'll be honest, I'm not an, first, I'm not enough of a theologian to pull all of that meaning out, and I won't try to do that this morning. But second, just like John, I know enough about God <clears throat> that I know that it lines up with who he is. He is set apart, and there's no darkness in him, and he has no part in it. <clears throat> and James, Jesus' half-brother, says the same in James 1.16. He says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So why are we spending time here talking about God is light? Because if we look at God and his character, who he is, how big he is, how he operates, how good he is, how different and just set apart he is, we might start to see how beautiful he is. We might start to see what John was saying, that he is light and he is life. We might start to believe that when he comes into a situation, that the darkness will run. It'll be expelled. One of the most beautiful pictures I've seen someone paint with words of this creation event is in uh, C.S. Lewis' book um, in his Chronicles of Narnia. And he's recording this founding of a magical world. And the main character here, Diggory, finds himself by, a, by a unfortunate circumstances and series of events landed into this new world that is completely dark. He can't even see his face in front of him. <clears throat> and then something out of that darkness happens. And I'll read for us. It says, In the darkness something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. And it was very far away. And Diggory found it hard to believe or hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes he almost thought it was out of the earth beneath him. His lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth itself. And there were no words, there was hardly even a tune, but it was beyond comparison the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. And then later on it goes to describe, far away, down near the horizon, the sun began to turn gray. A light wind, very fresh, began to stir. The sky in that one place grew slowly and steadily paler. And you could see the shapes of the hills standing against, up against the dark. And all the time, the voice went on singing. I love this picture of God singing life into existence and wanted to share it with you today because he's allowing his beauty to overflow into his creation. And there's this slow progression of light's effect on this new world. 
and how everything transitions from darkness to slowly seeing these outlines and shapes and then finally colors and contrast. Just like we would experience the sunrise ourselves. But maybe it feels a little bit more like night right now. Maybe that's physically, literally. Maybe it's metaphorically. You see, the time did just change recently, and and the night sometimes comes before we make it home from work these days. Or maybe it's just difficult to see things. The same thing, things seem dim and obscure and incomplete. Maybe there's a situation that doesn't make sense right now. Maybe it's a small one. Maybe it's a big one. But because God is light, our future is incredibly bright with Him. It may be dark right now. In fact, we will have many times in our lives that will seem dark. In all of our lives, once we see Jesus face to face, we'll look back and say, now I know what light is. That was the dark. But that's not where we're at today. Today we're waiting for that future day. And we're waiting in the dark for the morning light. Another question, who here is a morning person? You'd like to get up early. I find myself a lot of mornings sitting in the dark holding this Bible, holding God's Word. And most of my days look quite busy and there's a lot of things to do But in the morning and in the dark, I hold this word. Sometimes I'm reading it. Sometimes I'm just holding it because I'm just still waking up. But I am waiting with the Lord. And I love the picture of the light just slowly illuminating the things that I can't see before that light comes up. And that's the same way this word is. This word, there are many things in my life right now that don't make sense to me, but I'm going to keep holding on to this word until it does. I'm going to keep holding on to him. And there's a great song that captures all of these emotions in me and maybe in you as we're waiting in the dark, and I want to share it with you. It's a song by Andrew Peterson. It's called The Dark Before the Dawn. And this is how he starts the song. He says, I've been waiting for the sun to come blazing up out of the night like a bullet from a gun until every shadow is scattered and every dragon's on the run. Oh, I believe, I believe that the light is going to come and that this, this is the dark. This is the dark before the dawn. And he goes on further to describe this dark. He calls it the storm. He says, this is the storm, this is the storm, the storm before the calm. This is the pain, the pain before the balm. This is the cold, the cold. It's the cold before the warm. These are the tears, the tears before the song. This is the dark. And he laments of only seeing darkness. He says, sometimes all I see is this darkness. Well, can't you feel the darkness? This is the dark before the dawn. And then here's where it kind of pivots. He says, I'm just waiting for a change. Change. Lord, I'm waiting for a change. And even in the darkness, he's speaking to the Lord. And that's what we do with these truths and our emotions. Just like this song is singing, we turn to the God who is light, no matter how dark it is around us. And we wait with him because while we're talking about tasting and seeing I think it's appropriate that we talk about how the the eye works the the human eye only receives light there is no generation of light from the eye we have to get ourselves around the light to see it if we want to see something we need to be around the Lord if we want to see we need to be around his word this is not just a group of stories 
This is a revelation of this God who is light. It's him letting himself be known to us. It teaches us how to wait, how to live. Psalm 119 shows us this. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. You can kind of fill in the blank with what you don't have understanding on right now. Therefore, I hate every false way because your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, God's word is a lamp today for our current circumstances. It shows us where our feet are and the next step that we need to take. And it is a light to our path and our future hope in him. And what I love about God's words is they're true whether I believe them or not. We didn't have to believe that the sun was going to rise today. It did it regardless of us. When I sit by that window in my home and, and it's dark, the sun's going to rise whether I believe it will or not. When you sit in the dark and hold on to God's words, whether you believe them or not, they're true. That's how big he is. And in the best and in our worst times, we can come to him and his words. And he can show us how to live, how to wait. And I have to pull up one more C.S. Lewis quote <clears throat> here. And he's talking in this context about why he believes. And he starts this, it's a paper called Is Theology Poetry? And he starts the, with a short phrase. He says, I was taught in school when I'd done a sum to prove my answer. And then he goes on to talk a lot about how he proves that answer. But then the summary is this. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. It's just a good reminder for us what makes sense to us outside of God. Where is he shining his light and where do we need him to shine his light so things start to become clearer? So this week, whatever you're thinking about right now, whatever passages come into your mind. Maybe it's something that we're sharing this morning. Maybe it's something that's coming to mind that you read some years ago. Someone in your life spoke over you. Write that reference down. Write just a note down in your bulletin or in your journal. And then this week, go find that. Put your finger on the text and then write it down. And then write what God's telling you through that. Something that's been sweet, something that's been hard to believe, and anything in between. Because this is God's word, it's, a, it's alive. John said that it is his life, so let's run to that life. And John's talking about Jesus, how he came in flesh. And he's this ultimate revelation of who God is and what he's like. Because God's revealed himself in songs, in, in the Psalms, in, in wisdom, in the Proverbs, and, and ultimately in his son, in the Gospels. And Hebrews 1 clearly says this, that there were many ways that God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he spoke to us by his son. And he goes on to describe the son as the radiance of the glory of God. Now, there's a cool picture I can put in your minds. That if you don't know, the sun is quite large and quite hot. Um, it's very far away, some 93 million miles away. And so if you have this image of what is he trying to say by the radiance of the glory of God, he's literally describing God, the Father, as a son. I know that's kind of confusing because it's like Father, Son, but S-U-N. 
And then Jesus as the rays of light traveling that 93 million miles to us. You see, the, the, the giant fireball that is the sun so far away does not only light up these skies and give light to everything, it actually warms our skin. And when I was looking at this, this was one of the sweet things that I found in the text as I was preparing for today. You see, when Jesus let his light shine into the world, it was not to a formless and void world, but it was to a people. Matthew 4, 16 says that the people were dwelling in darkness. They have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And one more ask for this week. With your Bible, with your journal, if you can do this outside or near a window, I just strongly recommend that if you're able. And just think about these images of, I see this sun, it's so far away, but somehow I still feel it right here on my skin. can see it with my eyes. And that's what Jesus did. He did not stay far off. John 1, 1, 5 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And his light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, Jesus did not come into an empty place, but he had friends. He ate with people. He laughed with them. He cried with them. He walked with them and showed them how to walk in his light, even when everything around them was dark. In fact, there never was nor has been a darker day than when Christ was crucified on the cross. You see, he prepared his friends for this. He told them this day was coming. And then it finally came in Matthew 27, recording the death of Christ on the cross. And it says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. So maybe you use AM, PM, or maybe you use military time. This is counting the hours from, from the light of the day. This was about noon to 3 p.m. The brightest time of the day literally went dark because the light of the world was slain. But the darkness did not overcome the light. In the same way that if we turned all these lights off, we shut all the TVs off, we closed all these doors, that candle would still be lit, no matter how dark it is in here. And that's the truth about who God is. Matthew 28 says, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day, Mary and Mary went to see the tomb. They didn't see the tomb, they saw their risen Savior. And he told them, come near. And they touched him, and they worshipped him. He gave them greetings. And then he encouraged them. He said, don't be afraid. Don't worry. What just a beautiful picture of who God is. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they'll see me too. Best thing we could ever hope for in experiencing and seeing the character of God is in his son Jesus. He says, I'm here. He says, I'm living proof that light is greater than the darkness. And we're so fortunate today that we have the whole story. In just a short time together, we can go all the way from Genesis to Revelation. I'm so grateful for that, that I live in these days. Because we know that there is a day when darkness will be no more. And in Revelation 21... This same 
disciple of Jesus, the same friend of Jesus, records this. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. And by its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never shut by day, by day, and there will be no night there. So this separation that God created in the beginning is no longer needed. In fact, the sun and the moon is no longer needed because Jesus is on the throne. His light shines into every dark place. There's not literally not even night anymore. And as we kind of close our time together, I want to I want to finish reading this song to you. I won't sing it to you, um, but I want to finish reading this song to you from Andrew Peterson. In how we wait, he says, "So I'm waiting for the King." As they come galloping out of the clouds while the angel armies sing, he's going to gather his people under the shadow of his wings. And I'm going to raise my voice with the song of the redeemed because all this darkness is a small and passing thing. I had a dream that I was waking at the burning edge of dawn and I could see the fields of glory and I could hear the sower's song. I had a dream that I was waking at the burning edge of dawn and all that rain had washed me clean and all the sorrow was gone. I had a dream that I was waking at the burning edge of dawn and I could finally believe that the king had loved me all along. I had a dream that I was waking at the burning edge of dawn. I saw the sower in the silver mist. He was calling me home. You see, these truths are true today, they're true tomorrow, and they'll be true forever, that God is light. And as we get ready to come to the table, I was thinking about Thanksgiving coming up, and some of these truths we can taste and experience today. There are areas of our life where we need light to shine now. And some of these truths are our hope in the future. And so when we come to this table, we see that. We see Jesus' body broken for us. We see his cup, which is his covenant, his blood poured out for us. And we're going to take this, just like Thanksgiving's coming. And just like when we're ready for that meal to be done, has anybody ever been really impatient and you just want to try something before it's quite done in the oven? We're going to come and take and taste today with anticipation that one day we will sit at an actual table with the God who is light and we'll eat with him and we'll fellowship with him and we'll look back at everything that was dark before and it'll be gone because it'll be with him in the light. So come and take a foretaste of what is to come.